So in module three, we're going to talk about the roles of the interpreter and ethics for court interpreters. When you walk into a courtroom and you start, before you start interpreting, the judges generally will um, uh, administer the oath to you. And I want you to remember this clearly. I want you to cut it, put it in a little card somewhere and remember it very clearly because based on what you are swearing here, you should be able to perform the same way. You are actually swearing to accurately, completely, and impartially um, interpret using the best skill and judgment. So that's a pretty high bar, and you have to remember that when you are doing your job, this isn't a simple thing. This isn't just being bilingual. We know a lot more than just being bilingual. So keep this in mind. You will make a good interpreter and um, you will make less mistakes probably. The judges and juries and attorneys and everybody rely on the interpreter version of the testimony to draw conclusions about credibility or um, you know, to place weight on the witnesses basically. In fact, the judges instruct um, the jurors, for example, that if somebody speaks the same language as the witness, they have to disregard whatever they're listening to or hearing or understanding. They have to actually go by whatever the interpreter said, even if they think that a mistake was made. They have to actually um, only use the interpreter uh, rendition because that is what the record is going to reflect. We interpret into English because the court um, record is kept in English. The in the person for whom we interpret, the limited English profici proficiency person, or LEP, um, should hear precisely the question the way it was asked. We should not simplify, uh, modify it, or omit it, or, or make it simpler, or stronger, or anything of that sort. We have to, that sort, we are supposed to just simply repeat as close as possible um, to the source language, to the source question what was asked. If that person doesn't understand, that person will be able to say, I don't understand this or that, and the, interpret the attorney can repeat. Um, the interpreter cannot embellish or edit or make anything simpler or more, com more sophisticated, and we simply have to conserve every element of what is being said um, in the original message because there's a reason for that. So, for example, oh, so one of the very important items that I just mentioned is called the register. It is very important to maintain the, the same register and we talked about this a couple of weeks ago when we were in class and uh, somebody said, well, you know, um, sometimes I have to actually take the word or whatever the attorney is saying and make it easier for the person to understand because they don't, they're uneducated, they're not used to those words, they don't know what I'm saying. You forget about that because that is absolutely not allowed in court interpreting. We are in a completely different environment when you are in medical interpretation or on, um, on a community interpretation, it's a different story. Here, this is on the record and if you were an English speaker and the attorney is an English speaker and he's asking you questions that are very high elevated level, nobody is there to dumb it down for you. So the same way has to happen with the person that doesn't speak the language. Um, there is all you can do on your pre-session, for example, instruct the person that if he doesn't understand something, he should or she should ask the attorney to rephrase that or ask or state it in a different way, but you are not allowed to turn that into an easier way. Register is the level of language that people are using. For example, if an attorney says, what did you observe the subject do subsequently, we don't simply say, uh, what did you see him do next? It, it, that's a very simple example, but um, that's what I'm talking about, the register, basically. The word choice is a very important thing, too, because depending on the words can be tricky and can mean different things, and depending on the choice of words that we use, um, the, ju the jurors and judges and the attorneys will draw different conclusions. So, for example, a, there was a study done where um, witnesses were asked um, the same statement, changing the word on a car accident, for example, and the question was something like, how, how fast were the, car, uh, the cars going when they hit? And somebody was asked, how fast were the cars when they smashed into each other or they collided or they bumped? Where they can't, you know, contact the, each other. So the 
result of that test was that actually people tend to exaggerate the events when you use stronger words like smashed um, or minimize things if you say bump, for example. So that is what one of the reasons why it's important to do that. Idiomatic expressions are super, super important and complicated for us sometimes because Americans talk with a lot of idiomatic expressions. You have to understand that idiomatic expressions have meaning um, because they have acquired meaning through their usage. Sometimes it, they're never literal, okay? So you don't interpret them literally. We're going to talk more about this on chapter f on um, module five, actually, and there is a, a very long, a long list of, of um, examples there. But I also want you to start thinking and make a list of idiomatic expressions. Or every time I hear you hear an idiomatic expression, try to think of the equivalent on your own language. And let me explain what I'm saying about not um, interpreting literally. When somebody says between a rock and a hard place, we know what it means they're not meaning literally that you are actually physically between a wall and a rock, okay? They're meaning, the meaning of that idiomatic expression is that you're in, tough pla in a difficult position, you're in a difficult situation, okay? When you render, when you are interpreting that to your LEP person, you're not gonna say literally that because the person is not gonna understand anything. They're not gonna understand what they're saying, what you are saying. You need to interpret the meaning of that. So let me go to Spanish because it's the only language I know, I'm sorry, but um, for example, in Spanish, the equivalent to between a rock and a hard place is not entre una piedra y un lugar duro. It is actually a completely different statement. For me, at least, somebody else may know a different one, but for me, for example, in Argentina, we use entre la espada y la pared. For those who don't speak Spanish, that literally would be between the sword and the wall. So you see they're completely different expressions, but the meaning is the same. You are in a tough place. So that is what you need to find. And there are examples, and like I said in the book, there are, you know, there are many. This is the kind of expressions that you hear in court all the time, and that's sometimes where you get stuck and you don't know how to render that. Um, and they don't make any sense if you do them literally. Obscenities, you're gonna see them all the time. You need to get used to it. It is very, very, very important for you to actually interpret them and not minimize them or say it is absolutely inappropriate for you to say, well, I don't wanna say that word. It's not, uh, I understand that we all have um, religious beliefs and cultural beliefs and, and things like that, but we have to also understand that we are professionals and we are getting into this to be professionals and to do a job that is very important in court. That is not something that is there just, you, know, you can't replace them. It's a very different thing when somebody is actually saying obscenities. Um, it shows the character of that person, it shows the aggressiveness of that person, and if you are refusing to say that, the judge can't tell what, what actually, it can't see those details, for example. Sometimes the, the witness themselves will say, well, he said bad words to me, and the judge will actually say, tell me what bad words he said, because maybe for somebody, uh, damn it, it's a bad word, and, and for somebody else, it's just nothing, you know what I'm saying? So it's, that's why it's so important that somebody, that the, the words are actually said, and for us, we have a responsibility to repeat those and to find the closest meaning to that and not just say, Oh, she said a bad word. Repetitions and redundancies. Sometimes people uh, tend to repeat certain statements or tend to, um, for example, if somebody asks, um, what, what time did you get there? And the witness goes, well, I think I, I, I think, I think I, I think I got there at, at three, that is exactly how you have to render it. You don't just say, well, I think I got there at three. There is a big difference on that. That doubt, that repetition, that is something that actually means something for people listening to this and analyzing the cases. So you have to actually repeat those things too. See, like when somebody says, I, I, I didn't see it, it's not the same as saying, no, I didn't see it. 
the certainty with, with which somebody says that is different and that is important for you to render as well. Um, the, when somebody says, did you watch and observe, you don't just re say, did you see them do that? Did you watch and observe? Because they're two different things and they like, did you see or did you watch and observe is a different intensity or a different activity in a way that there is a reason why they're doing that. Self-corrections and false starts, same thing, you're supposed to repeat those. Um, attorneys sometimes go, for example, uh, Your Honor, I would like to ask for, uh, scratch that, and then ask the question again. You need to repeat that as well. If somebody says, if the witness says, um, well, I went there at three o'clock, no, 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 hold on. I went there at five o'clock, you do exactly the same. You don't just omit the first part because he corrected himself. You go, well, I went there at three. No, no, no. I went there at five. With the same tone, with the same, you have to perform that for people to see that. Um, third person references, um, when very common sometimes with our witnesses that they'll say, she went there and then they brought me food and they went here and she was there but he wasn't and he did that and he, okay those things have to be corrected and if if you don't know like sometimes you can put them in context best based on how the story is going but if you don't then you need to ask for clarification to be able to render it properly we're not allowed to embellish clarify or edit anything like i mentioned before fragmentary statements like this like I went to the you know um, and there was a it was there you interpret it like that you don't go I went to the house and it was there you don't omit the repetitions you have to also go with the whole sequence of repetitions that they're doing because that has meaning for them nonsensical testimony usually happens with mentally impaired people or excited people victims of um, violent crimes or people who have lost loved ones um, these are very difficult in mental health for example often you have to switch to and interpret simultaneously at the same time because they won't stop they'll they'll ramble and go on and on and on and on and on and you can't stop them and you can't um, because you want them to keep the flow and you can't remember all of that either. So you have to be able to somehow render that if you're on the stand, you're gonna have to probably do it simultaneously. You're gonna have to raise your voice and do it out loud, or you can actually ask the judge to instruct the witness to stop, but it's not gonna happen if it's a mental health issue. Um, with people who are crying and, and very emotional, it, I'm not telling you that you have to stand there and cry, but you have to somehow produce, reproduce that for everybody too. Um, I'm gonna show you a video when we get together next class too, so that you can see a little bit of that. Emotions, like I said, same thing. And interpret emotions, we don't have them. Remember that? You don't have them. Yes, we do have them. I know that we have them. You're gonna be sad, you're gonna be mad, you're gonna be all kinds of feelings you're gonna have and emotions but you're never gonna show them in court. It is, you need to be professional, you need to keep those to yourself, you're gonna see people going to jail for the rest of their life, to prison, you're gonna see parents of children that have been raped and killed, um, you're gonna see divorced people, sad, crying, and people that are losing you know, their homes or having to pay, you're gonna see ma many things in court that are very hard. But we are professionals, just the same way attorneys are. When there is a trial, for example, judges will always say to the actual victims and the parties to not make any comments or, you know, uh, demonstrations of any type after the verdict is read. So we have to make sure that we are in that same game as well. We can be. We, it's not appropriate. It's, not, it's unethical for us to actually show or be crying or be, you know, hugging the victims or hugging the defendant or something like that. Often um, witnesses use hand, hand gestures. So um, I'm not talking about like this kind of hand gestures when, well, I went there and then what happened is like, yeah, I use a lot of hand gestures. I have to work hard at keeping them to myself when I'm interpreting. 
but what I'm referring to specifically is that sometimes people will say, um, for example, uh, where did the bullet hit you? Well, it hit me over here and it came out this way and then um, he also hit me here. So we, the interpreter does not do that. You do not say it, it hit me here and here and here. You just stand there and simply say, well, it hit me here and then here and it came out over here and it also hit me here. The attorney is the one that will guide the witness to actually say that with words. The reason for that is because, okay, yes, we have video of what's happening in court, but the, but the record is kept in words, in written, the, the record is written. So the, inter the attorney will generally instruct the witness to say, uh, or the attorney will say, for example, um, may the court reflect that the witness is touching her right, her left shoulder or things like that. But or they will instruct the witness to say, tell me with words, where did the bullet hit you? And then the person may say, well, it hit me on the left shoulder. And th that is the reason for that. Um, conservation and clarification of ambiguities. For example, on the statement, did you have anything to drink in the car? That can mean different things, right? It can mean, were you drinking in the car? Did you have alcohol in the car? Or it can mean, did you have anything in the car that can be drunk, <laughs> that can be consumed by people? So that kind of ambiguity, sometimes you have to clarify them or ask the judge to allow you to clarify that because the attorneys may be doing that on purpose to, to trip the witness, but you, but in, in English, this is an ambiguity and this can mean two things in Spanish or in your language there may be two completely different statements that you have to ask that depending on what they're trying to ask. So um, that's why you need to clarify those when they come up across. Uh, procedures for repetition, clarifications, and corrections. When um, you are stepping outside of the interpreter role, uh, we've talked about this a few times, you have to switch to third person so that the record will reflect that you are the person that is needing a clarification or that the interpreter is the one clarifying something um, and not the witness. If the volume is too spe to the speech is too low, for example, you should be able sh you can, you know, uh, um, professionally and, and quietly somehow raise your hand or stand up and say, Your Honor, the interpreter cannot hear the witness. Um, if you can please instruct the witness to speak a little louder. Um, those kind of statements sometimes it's good for you to pr write them down and practice in front of a mirror because it's hard to switch to third person and it's hard to speak up in front of you know a, a jury trial or a group of people that are all quiet and somebody's testifying. Um, if you don't understand a term you will say your honor the interpreter does not understand a term may the interpreter uh, clarify with a witness or uh, may the interpreter get a repetition the interpreter did not hear. Um, Error corrections, very important. They happen. We are not perfect. We don't know all the words and sometimes depending on the context and depending on where we are from, we might find things, we may interpret something one way and it ends up being a different thing when as you go through or somebody corrects you. Somebody says, no, that I don't think that's the word that you said. Um, it is important for you to actually say, your honor, the interpreter needs to correct the record um, when the witness used this word, the interpreter interpreted as such, but the, re the correct translation of that word is this other one. Um, and that is again, because sometimes in context, you don't need, um, you don't know exactly what they're trying to say. If you need to address the witness or ask somebody for clarification in court, don't talk directly to the person. Don't, it's very, it happens. I'm not gonna tell you it doesn't happen, the normal, the, the instinct that we have is to say, what? Like, repeat that? It happens, you will see me doing it. Um, but the proper way to do it is to say, your honor, may the interpreter ask the witness to repeat, repeat the, the answer. Um, or your honor, may the interpreter uh, ask the, the counsel, the attorney, to repeat the question. Um, because otherwise it can be seen as if we, I am actually giving, first of all, if I say, what do you say? The court reporter will actually write that the witness said, what did you say? They won't switch it to the interpreter. And that's a different thing when you have it on the record. 
and the other on the other hand when you are talking like that with a witness it seems like you are actually conferring with the window witness or asking um, or giving advice and you want to avoid that uh, when the interpreter's expertise is needed sometimes you have to there are terms that are complicated or they can mean different things or can be um, used in different ways that they are for example uh, culturally bound and you need to clarify certain things and those are times again where you need to put yourself in a situation where you are identifying yourself as the interpreter and not one of the parties and at this point usually the record stops or the record reflects that the interpreter needs to clarify something um, if a term for example is let's say food there are certain foods that there is no uh, direct translation for that like if somebody says tamales okay that is a Hispanic food that there is no translation in English because it's not an, an American word uh, an American meal so you will normally just use the Spanish word or the, the on the language that you know it uh, that the witness said it and you can also uh, at the same time write it down in a piece of paper and hand it to the um, court officer for him or her to give to the court reporter so that they can write it properly on the record. That is okay to do, or you can say, Your Honor, the interpreter can give the, um, or the interpreter can spell that for the record, um, and then you can spell it. Um, checking definition of unfamiliar terms. I often have my phone with me or an iPad. Uh, sometimes I've had court in reporters, the court interpreter, sorry, court um, officers, what used to be called bailiffs, we don't call them bailiffs anymore, or court officers that may come to me and say, you can't use your phone. Well, we use our phone as a tool. We use our phone because we have glossaries or places to research words and not because we are talking on the phone or texting. So you want to clarify that sometimes you might want to just tell them, hey, I'm going to be using my phone for in case that I need a clarification of the term or something like that. But it also you can you might be more comfortable having a dictionary. I feel awkward having a dictionary out there and starting to look for a dictionary because I never was into paper dictionaries, but it's actually an appropriate thing to do. It's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, using English, again, when the, sometimes witnesses will respond in English. You want to kind of clarify that also at front when you do a pre-session with your um, witness and you explain how you're gonna be working and how it's gonna happen, what's gonna, you know, the, the proceeding. Um, you wanna tell them to try to stick to um, speaking their language and not responding in English. However, they do it very often. They say their name, for example, obviously, the way it sounds, the way they say it, and they may say yes instead of see, si, instead of yes on their language, or they might say, you know, whatever words that may come up in English or statements that they might make in English. If Even if they make a statement in English, you repeat them, you repeat them into English as well. For one, because sometimes you can understand their English, but second, because remember the word of the interpreter is the one that goes on the court record, so you have to repeat it. If they ask, okay, what is your name? And I say Christina Fraser, you repeat Christina Fraser. Even though everybody heard clearly my name, you have to repeat it. Um, questions from the witness. Sometimes an attorney will ask, for example, so where were you on that day? And the witness turns to you and says, does he mean if I was at home or where? So you're gonna turn around and say, does he mean if I was home or where? You don't answer the question. You refer it back to them in the same way that it was asked, or you can actually, you know, sometimes I may just turn around and say, uh, do you mean, like I will talk to them, but the proper thing to do is actually to repeat it exactly the way you heard it. Um, response to challenges. Sometimes that's a little bit hard to do because um, some people in either on the audience or attorneys will challenge what you are saying. Um, so for example, I had one opportunity where an attorney says, no, well, that, that's not what it means, that word doesn't mean this, whatever, things like that. So you need to be respectful in that way. That's gonna happen. Sometimes it helps you. We don't know everything and sometimes we do make a mistake. Sometimes we are so 
um, embedded in what we are doing that we may interpret red instead of blue. It happens. So if that happens, if somebody corrects you or something, you can say, Your Honor, can we review the, the audio to, to, or can we repeat the question or can we re-ask the client to make sure that I interpret correctly? Or if you are very sure and they are questioning a term that you know very well or that there is an explanation for that term to be this and not what the attorney is telling you, then you will say the interpreter stand by her interpretation of the word such and period. But again, people like people are not trying to make you look bad. It's simply that sometimes that affects their client and they're going to try to correct it. Um, sometimes it's not the attorney, sometimes it's just one of the parties. Professional relationships. We become friends with attorneys. We, even if you are with attorneys, with judges, with anybody in court that we work a lot, it, even in times when you have a jury trial, let's say, that you've been, it's a four day trial and you've been two, three days sitting next to the defendant. That doesn't mean that we are the interpreter for the defendant, but it sure looks like it. Um, the jury looks at us and they think that we are actually the defendant's interpreter, when in reality, we are actually the court's interpreter. We interpret for the record and to ensure that justice is carried um, properly and it has nothing to do with who is the, inter the, the person needing the interpreter. So it's important for you to behave properly when you are sitting next to a defendant, for example. You can clarify. Sometimes it happens to me that I see a defendant 50 times before a trial and you get to know them and they are the only person that they ever see because they are in jail and nobody sees them. So you kind of develop a certain, re not relationship, but a certain acquaintance with, with those people. So you need to tell them, listen, when we go in the court, um, I'm not gonna be very, you know, I'm gonna be very serious and I'm not gonna be chatting or laughing with you because uh, you know, it, I, I am, I have to be professional and I have to not show any preferences or anything like that. So just keep in mind, I'm not being mean or I'm not being nasty, but I'm just keeping my distance because of the job that we have to do and the jury needs to see that. Um, and another thing, very important actually, one time, you know, sometimes I feel very sorry for certain people and when you think what they're doing in jail and they're locked up and they are, you know, I one day was sitting there and I had candy and I was eating candy while I was interpreting and um, I turned around and gave one to the defendant. I offered to the attorneys and I offered one to the defendant and the court officer stopped me. We're not allowed to do that. Um, only anything that comes from the court officers can go to the defendants and they will never give them a piece of candy. They will never, the only thing they'll give them is water because if something were to happen to that person, it would be on us. So avoid doing that kind of things. And again, it shows like you're being friendly and things like that. It's very important to be unobstructive, unobstructive in, um, in, um, in the court. Um, sometimes, you know, interpreters are, we are kind of on TV there. We are in front of everybody. People are fascinated because they look at what we are doing and they're like, you know, they start daydreaming and things like that. So try to keep uh, yourself in a place where, you know, you can do your job, but you're not the center of attention of everybody. Um, you know, sometimes, for example, when we are doing closing statements, if we are close, sitting close to the jury um, box, first of all, we might be annoying them because they are hearing us like mumbling because we are doing interpreta simultaneous interpretation. But second, they will actually start staring at us instead of listening to what the attorney is saying or instead of listening to the witness or things like that. So let's, you know, that it's, it's important to just keep being professional and, and sort of invisible a little bit in court as well. Cultural expertise is something that we should be the, the, one, the, the person to go to. Sometimes there are things that have to be clarified. You just have to uh, make sure that, again, you step outside of your, your interpreting role and say the interpreter needs to clarify something and then you can explain something that may be happening um, that may be a different, give a different impression um, on the testimony. Interpreter fat fatigue is real. Um, you get very tired, especially when you are interpreting for hours and hours. Um, that's why AOS, uh, Rule 42 actually allows for any procedures that are proceedings that may be more than two hours to be worked with two interpreters. So it's important for you to know your limitations and to know if you're gonna be able to do something for so many hours or not. 
Um, I am not as strict on that because some people, people are, everybody's different. Some people have the capacity of doing longer uh, um, sessions, interpreting, and others not. And I particularly get distracted when I have a partner, for example. But I do always have a partner when I have long proceedings. Um, especially when you have to do, for example, jury instructions and things like that that are very lengthy and very fast. And also when you're doing um, interpreting on the stand for the witness, you wanna make sure that you are very accurate on that. And as you start getting tired, your accuracy start going down as well. Familiarization with the case is very important. Often attorneys will, in my case, they'll email me and they said, I need an interpreter for a trial on such and such day and period, nothing else, the language and that's it. Well, I need to know, I will call them back or email them back and say I need to know, is it a jury trial or a non-jury trial? There's a big difference there. It's probably a whole day difference on that. Um, how many witnesses do you have? How many people need the interpreter? Not because you need to have two, three interpreters, but because this is the other thing. If you ask them, will the interpreter be needed for the entire trial or just for the witness testimony? I will tell you that 99.9% .9 of the time, attorneys will tell you just for testimony. Now, if you ask them, do the parties speak English normally? Do they communicate with you in English? fine and they just want the interpreter because they don't feel comfortable testifying in English or do you actually normally have to use someone to interpret for you because they don't understand so that will give you a little better idea and if they for example one that I had recently he said well the husband understands good English I talked to him and then he translates for the wife okay period you need two interpreters there going to be a full trial, it's going to be two, three days, and you need two people to interpret there because it's going to be simultaneous interpretation. Um, but mainly what you need to familiar, another more important yet is to know what the case is about. If they don't, some, ideally you could get some sort of file, something, a few documents or something where you can read, you can read the name of the parties, um, you can read addresses and have notes on addresses and things like that to make it easier for you and to see what is the subject of the case. But if you can get that, because that's very rarely people will give you that, will send you that, but at least ask them what is the subject matter. Because if they're telling you, uh, well, it's just a, a, a motor vehicle accident lawsuit, is very different as if they say it's a DNA profile given erroneously and something like that. And now you're like, well, I have never interpreted on DNA experts and I bet you this is gonna be a lot of experts here and I don't know that I'm familiar with that case, with that type of thing. So if you actually don't ask this ahead of time, you're gonna go there and you're gonna find out that you have a subject matter that you are totally unfamiliar with and you're not gonna be able to interpret and you should not interpret for that. You should recuse yourself if you see that, that um, or if you know that that's not something that you can handle. But if you had notice, previous notice, then you have time to review things. We are not, we don't know all the words and all the subjects. We study all the time. So that is when, you know, why you have to ask those things ahead of time. You don't need to, again, yes, it would be nice to have documents or the file. You can go to the clerk's office and ask for the file. They are generally public record and they will give them to you. But at least you need to know the subject matter. A auditability, again, if you can hear clearly, you need to be heard very clearly. So you need to speak out loud. The witness has to speak out loud, even if they're speaking in the, when they're speaking in their own language. Everything is recorded generally, and you wanna have that. Pre-testimony interview is what you do with the witness before you go in. But make sure you do this with somebody else with you. Go, if it's the victim, go with the victim's advocate. Do it with a court officer, do it with, or get someone else to be there. Um, with the attorney, avoid at all costs to be alone with a witness at any time because that is just trouble waiting to happen. Um, people see and interpret things differently and the best you can do is to um, not be alone with that person, avoid com 
if you are in a room with the DA and the witnesses and the DA walks out and says, I'll be back in a second, you walk out and stand outside the door. Um, you don't want to try, the best thing is not to hear things that you are not supposed to hear and you know what I mean? Avoid those situ that situation because it's going to get you in trouble. Um, but what you want to do is meet with that person and say, hi, my name is so-and-so, I'm going to be your interpreter, I want to explain a couple of things, tell me your name so you know the spelling, for example, it, what is your address, because those are things that generally they're going to ask them, where are you from, sort of help you um, determine if you are if you can communicate well with that person and where they're from and stuff, um, to kind of change your dialects a little bit sometimes. If, you know, in Spanish that we have people from different countries and we sort of change the way certain words, um, it's important to know ahead. And then you tell them things like, for example, I'm gonna ask you questions as if he is the one asking you. I'm not gonna say, ask, he's asking you if you did this or that. I'm gonna just straight ask you the question you should not answer, tell him to do this or that. You should answer directly to him as if he's understanding you in Spanish and I will interpret for you. Um, if you understand some English, please still wait for me to ask you the complete question in Spanish before you answer. There may be things that you misunderstood or that are said differently and when I, after I answer the, I ask you the question, your answer may be different than what you just jumped ahead and did by yourself. So wait until I finish the question. If you're gonna respond, respond in, in Spanish or in your language and not in English. Um, you know, things like that that you need to, um, you know, sometimes it's good to tell them, for example, that you interpret everything that they are, for example, you're not just interpreting the questions. If there is a sidebar conversation, there is a conversation that goes on between the attorneys that is not a question to the witness, you still interpret that. And sometimes they look at you like you have two heads because why is she telling me that? Or they tend to respond. So explain that situation to them. Um, technical terminology, just like I said before, familiarize yourself with the case. There is some technical terminology that's gonna throw you off and you might not be able to interpret. So you wanna know ahead of time and you need to study. We are not geniuses we don't know all the words in the wor world and we need to we are constantly studying and that's why we need to know ahead of time what we are doing jury instructions are probably the most difficult thing that you're going to do they're very fast the jury instructions can be anywhere from 20 to minutes to two hours sometimes depending on what kind of case is it is the repetition so it's like if you look at one it'll be generally the same for that particular type of cases for example because they explain what rape of a child is or murder, first degree murder. So in general, they are repetitious. They're saying the same thing, just changing names and things like that. So you have to, uh, what's gonna happen, that's not, you're not gonna have a lot of notice to see that. You, they're gonna have the jury instructions ready pretty much 15 minutes before, or an hour before they do it. They are constantly talking about jury instructions during a trial when it comes to time for um, the jury instructions, the moment that the jury instructions are going to happen, usually they will have them printed and they will hand one to each of the attorneys and they will hand one copy to each of the jurors. You want to tell the clerk or the court officers that you want to have a copy of the jury instructions. And that is because, and again, take a read, a quick read. You're going to have sometimes 15 minutes or sometimes you know, the, the, the hour that they take for lunch for you to read them and you can actually, you know, write down certain terms that, for example, in Spanish, some um, uh, charges can, when you say them in Spanish, you have to flip the, the sentence. Um, so those things sometimes I'll write down or certain words that just, I just have a mental block with certain words and I'll write them on, on the paper so that I can follow through and, and say it quickly. They're gonna write, read them fast. You can ask them to try to read them slower, but generally judges tend to read them very fast and they might slow down a little bit and then they go on again. That's another time that you definitely want a partner there for that. Sometimes judges may disqualify your attorneys. If you did something, you may have said something that um, upset a witness or the witness goes to the DA or to the uh, defense attorney and says, mm, I, you know, this interpreter said this and that to me, the whatever, 
it may be. Attorneys can say, you know, that they want the interpreter to be removed, that they want a new interpreter, that can happen. And if you find something, if you also find that somehow you have a conflict of interest, that you have any kind of issues, you should inform the court and recuse yourself. Continuing education is what I said before, is the duty of our profession. We are never gonna know all, all the words. We might do a trial today and never do the same subject matter for five years. So every time we do it, we have to review our, our documents and our terminology and things like that. So um, it, we are con constantly learning and, and, and educating ourselves. I'm not talking about C, continuing education units for your credentials. I'm talking about the job that we have to do to be able to be qualified and capable of doing our jobs. So, but switching to ethics a little bit, I'm not going to talk a lot about this. You know very well what it is. Ethics is, is doing the right thing and what is, you know, certain norms that are uh, established for um, determining what is right and what is wrong or what is appropriate or not. So, um, you, back to the interpreter's oath, again, remember this, engrave it in your brains because this is going to help you a lot. I want you to read um, in your books, in, your, in the back of your books, uh, you're going to find the Rule 41 of the Tennessee Supreme Court. That is the rule that will have the standards of uh, the canons, the, ethic, the, ethic, the code of ethics for court interpreters. It's something that we've been talking already. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these. I want you to remember them clearly. You need to read this and know what you're supposed to do and not do because anybody can strip you of your, of your credentials with this. Canon one, accuracy and completeness. Canon, again, I'm, not gonna, I'm just gonna read the, the headlines and then you can um, read and, and we can talk more about this. Canon two, representation of qualification. You can't say that you are something that you are not. Um, some that you have credentials if you are not. For example, you can't go and say that you're a certified interpreter when you are not yet. Um, that is a violation of the Code of Ethics, an ethical violation. Canon three, impartial, impartiality and avoidance of conflict of interest. Again, what I said before, we interpret for the court, for the system, for the record, not for one party or the other. We have to make sure our mouth is closed and that um, we simply repeat and interpret and we don't give advice or anything like that. Um, professional demeanor, Canon 4, we have to dress in, a prop, in, a, in the appropriate way. We don't go to court in, uh, let me tell you, I've had people going to court in shorts. I'm not talking about defendants and people visiting the court. I'm talking about interpreters. Dress maybe on a suit that is a short pants suit and the judges will not allow you in the courtroom. You cannot wear jeans. You cannot wear flip-flops. You can in federal court, you can't even use open toe shoes. So just, you don't have to always wear a suit for men, for example, but yes, you wanna wear, you know, dress pants and a dress shirt, a tie if possible. Generally, you will see, depending on where you go, Davidson County is very um, formal in that way. At least that's what I'm told. The interpreters tell me that all the time. Um, but in, here in Davidson County, sometimes you feel awkward because if you don't have a suit, because everybody wears suits, both women and men. I mean, women may wear a dress with a, a suit jacket on top or things like that, but um, that's one aspect. The second is conduct yourself properly. Walk into the courtroom like a professional, be determined. You don't need to be pushy, but you need to be strong and determined, quiet, and be able to ask questions and, and, and act professionally. Don't be giggling or laughing or talking out loud or, you know, those are things that are just important. And again, the way you talk to victims or to witnesses or to defendants or anybody is, is very important. Um, and you need to act in a professional manner and in an unobstrusive, unobstrusive ma manner as possible. Confidentiality. You are this is absolutely like so important that I can't even, I don't know how to tell you, this is something that you have to be so, 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 so careful. It is very easy, very easy for us to, at the beginning at least, to turn around 
and tell people what we did or what happened with the defendant or what we took. Anything that is spoken between a person and his attorney or her attorney is confidential. We cannot violate that. That is a big problem if we do. And sometimes we interpret for several co-defendants and we hear one say one thing and then we go interpret for the other one who says a different thing. You shut, you cannot say a word to anybody. You cannot talk, you can't say, oh, but he just said that or that. You can actually create a big, big problem and you will indeed lose your credentials, I can tell you that. Um, restriction of public comment, same thing. You should not go out and talk about cases. Cases are very delicate sometimes and if you go out and make comments or post things on Facebook, please eliminate your, your social media like minimize your social media exposure as much as you can because anything you say often will be even if it has nothing to do with the case you were doing you may be saying something that is totally unrelated but you happen to be on a trial that is related to what you just said um, and that can cause trouble I know that we have freedom of speech that is totally fine um, I would suggest if you want to have that freedom of speech and and say whatever you want and talk about give your opinion about any kind of cases or anything like that or what your opinion is on gay marriage or on uh, murders or on uh, rape or whatever you want to say uh, use a use a, a, a an alias or something like that I think that professionally that's going to help you on the long run um, I used to, I, I mean, I never, I use social media a lot, but usually I'm just talking about my dogs and things like that. But sometimes I used to make comments that then with the years of working in court, I realize how important it is to keep them to yourself. Again, at least for your professional exposure, like you have kind of two separate accounts if you want or, or something like that, but be very careful what you post on social media. Um, this is very important too because this is very clear I don't have to explain to you you are limited you should limit yourself to do what you're supposed to do you cannot give uh, legal advice you can't express personal opinions you can um, uh, you know do anything that can appear to be partial or biased or or like you're giving advice to somebody or, or instructing like People have attorneys. If it's not, if they don't have an attorney, the DA might be the attorney, and if they don't have an attorney, they should have one. People will come to you and ask you, "What should I do here?" There, that you all you can say is, "Ma'am, sir, I can't give you advice. I am just a court interpreter. I'm not allowed to tell you." Some people will come and tell you, um, "Do you know any attorneys?" And you can say. I can give you a list of Spanish speaking attorneys if you want, if they want a, you know, an attorney that speaks their language, but you cannot say this guy is better than that. You stay out of it. Um, it'll, it'll protect you on the long run. Um, assessing and reporting impediments. Again, if, you have, if there are issues in the courtroom, like things are too quiet or you need to, um, you know, they need to speak louder or you need to be positioned in a different way, um, those are things that you want to assess and report and talk to the court if there is any issues because you want to be able to hear everything but also uh, the fact that if you have okay you woke up and you are hoarse or you are you have a persistent cough and you can interpret today well you might have to tell them that and it may not be able to work it um, or if the the terminology happens to be something completely different or, or than what you thought and you are unable to interpret, you need to also let them know. Um, again, interpreters ca obviously cannot commit criminal acts that reflect uh, adversely on their interpret honesty, trustworthiness, or fitness as an interpreter in other respects. Um, as you know, you're going to have a background check, so you, are, you can't have felonies, for example, on your records. And um, again, anything that, that's why I'm saying be careful with what you say because that also can 
be construed as a misconduct um, and how you conduct yourself and how you talk to people and to defendants and, and witnesses. Um, and very important here, this happens sometimes that, it happens sometimes that at interpreters, he, obviously we are in places and where we see and hear things that other people don't. Don't take it upon yourself to um, correct things that you consider ethical violations by the part of the attorneys or anybody. If you see an interpreter conduct, conducting themselves, conducting himself or herself unethically, you need to report that and you need to know who that is reported to. And that would probably be the judge, it will be the attorney. You want to get that out of you. You don't want to take it on with your inter with your colleague, or it may not be an interpreter, it may be an attorney that is actually being discriminatory or aggressive or whatever it may be that you see, whatever situation you see, don't ag address it yourself. Where you want, I mean, you have to assess it and think, okay, is this serious enough? Or is this just who he is and, and you know, it's over. But if you see something very serious, you need to actually go to the judge in private or go to, you know, the attorney or the other, someone in a position of power within the court um, and let them know what's happening. And the same, if you see a colleague conducting themselves inappropriately, you need to report it to the AOC, who is the people who actually the administrative office of the court that is who um, regulate what we do and, and, and takes care of making sure that we are doing our job. Uh, professional development, what we talked before, we are so, you know, required to study. We always have to improve our skills um, and that's what we do. We don't know everything, so we continue improving our skills and learning. And pro bono work services, we, there isn't a requirement specifically for X amount of hours like attorneys may have, but um, there is a, a recommendation, let's say, on Rule 42 that says the interpreter should be perf uh, performing um, um, pro bono work, that is volunteering. And again, when you are gonna renew your credentials every three years, you will actually get a um, report of, you will get a sheet that you have to report how many hours of um, pro bono work you did. So that's about it for this unit. Um, next unit, we're gonna talk a little bit more of practice, uh, practical stuff, and um, then we're gonna practice some in um, class as well. Thank you.